Welcome to Night School. I'm Darian. I'm Aria. And whether you're a night school regular or this is your first time tuning in, we are so happy that you are here. We are a program of Nightlife at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Nightlife is an in-person event that's happening right now out in the museum that mixes science and culture and art in a new way every single week, uh, Thursday night. And Night School, which you are watching right now, is Nightlife's online branch where we bring together scientists, creators, and experts to dig into a new topic and help us learn together every single month. Amazing. And tonight, we're celebrating something very special. Happy International Museum Day, everybody. What is everybody's favorite museums? Or what are everybody's favorite museums? Let us know. Um, and you can take a moment to thank them today because it's International Museum Day. Uh, and by joining forces with experts from three other natural history museums tonight, we're gonna get a glimpse into just the fraction of ways that museums can bring people together. And there are like a whole lot of ways. We'll be taking a closer look at very intricate, incredibly realistic models of glass plants, uh, or glass models of plants. <laughs> and we're also gonna learn about how scientists and librarians are unlocking massive treasure troves that are scientific collections to share their data with more people. And we're also gonna get into how anybody, literally anybody from around the world can contribute to the future of conservation and natural history research right from their own neighborhood. So a lot of ground to cover here, but covering ground just kind of seems to be the way that museums roll, <laughs> covering lots of ground, uh, which is honestly kind of amazing. And it just so happens that each one of our guests, as I mentioned, is from a different natural history museum, one in Cambridge, one in Mass. Cambridge, Massachusetts, one in Honolulu, Hawaii, and one in San Diego, California. And Darian, who will we get to hear from tonight? I'm so excited to answer that question. First off, Jennifer Ware is the collections manager of the Ware Collection of, or Jennifer Brown rather, is the collections manager of the Ware Collection of Blaschka Glass Models of Plants, AKA the Incredible Glass Flowers, housed at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. As one of the museum's most famous treasures, they require a lot of care. Add in that these hyper-realistic glass models are extremely finely detailed and sometimes over a century old, and you can imagine how much work it takes to, uh, like how much work goes into their care. Jennifer will share with us about their history and what it takes to preserve this peerless collection. Dr. Chandra Earle comes to us from the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii, up next, where she is a data scientist, a computational biology fellow, and a city organizer for the City Nature Challenge, a worldwide community science event focused on documenting local nature using one of my favorite platforms, iNaturalist. Chandra will share about this event's impacts in Hawaii and how museums can empower community scientists to play an instrumental role in aiding conservation efforts and advancing natural history research. And then lastly, Arielle Hammond joins us from the San Diego Natural History Museum, where she is the director of their research library and archives. Scientific data is often locked behind their metaphorical walls, digital paywalls, and even literal wall walls. Arielle will detail with us four different ways that the San Diego Natural History Museum has been working to break down barriers of access to scientific data so that we're all able to better participate in science. Very, very cool. And we're very excited to hear from all of our guests. And as always, tonight's program is live. Uh, so whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or Twitch, say hi, let us know where you're watching from in the world. And we'd love to know if it's your first time joining us or your 85th, because we've done 84 other episodes. <laughs> and we are so happy that you are here. And we have a Q&A after every single speaker. So put any questions that come up in the comments or in the chat. And I already saw one, Tom, uh, about that article in the LA Times, yes, there was a cameo of me in the LA Times. It was not an article <laughs> that I was quoted in, but it was an article about the City Nature Challenge, which we'll hear about from Shandra today. So 
pretty pretty fun um but anyways uh with that we will go ahead and pass it on to jennifer brown Hello. Oh, I am sharing the wrong screen. Happy International Museum Day to everybody. Okay. All right, uh, you should be able to see my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to. You can't see your presentation. I'm you so can't. sorry. Oh, thank you so <laughs> much for sharing it again. again. Okay. No worries. I don't know what's happening. This totally worked fine before. Let me try again. Okay, is that good? That great. Okay, I'll okay. leave you to it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I am so excited to tell you about the glass flowers at Harvard University. The official name of the glass flowers is the Ware Collection of Blaschka Glass Models of Plants. And this unique collection has educated students and the public, delighted museum visitors, and inspired artistic and scholarly works for more than a century. The collection includes astonishingly realistic life-size models that look like they were pulled from the ground or cut from a branch. And there are also magnified detail models that show plant parts in anatomical sections. The glass flowers are unsurpassed as works of art, and they are renowned for their scientific accuracy and craftsmanship. A museum was established at Harvard University to display materials from the zoology, botany, mineralogy, and geology departments. And the first portion of this university museum was built in 1859, and an addition for the botany department was completed in 1890. The addition included space for public exhibits in the Botanical Museum. The Glass Flowers Commission began while the botany department edition was under construction. The glass flowers have been on display in the same gallery since the Botanical Museum opened in 1890. The Botanical Museum collections, um, including the glass flowers, were eventually transferred to the Harvard University Herbaria, and the Harvard Museum of Natural History uh, was established in 1998 as the public face of the Herbaria, the Museum of Comparative Zoology, and the Mineralogical and Geological Museum. So today, the glass flowers are on permanent exhibition at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, and they belong to the Harvard University Herbaria. The Herbaria has 5 million specimens that document the world's flora and illustrate plant diversity. Um, I share this institutional history uh, because I mentioned the Botanical Museum and the Harvard Museum of Natural History in this presentation. And they're basically interchangeable when I talk about where the glass flowers are on display. Professor George Lincoln Goodale was a botanist and the founding director of the Botanical Museum. He commissioned the glass flowers as a teaching collection that would also be a museum exhibit. Goodale was inspired by the displays of mounted animals in the Museum of Comparative Zoology, but creating a similar exhibit about botany was difficult because of how plants look when they're preserved. Mammals, birds, and other animals can look lifelike when they're taxidermied, but plant specimens are pressed and dried, then mounted on paper or barium sheets, or they're preserved in liquid. Goodale wanted more exceptional scientific models than ones made from paper mache or wax. He also thought these materials would be susceptible to deterioration over time. Here you can see how effective the glass models are. And in this comparison between a living iris and the glass model. Goodale saw models of marine invertebrates made from glass on display in the Museum of Comparative Zoology, 
while he was planning exhibits for the Botanical Museum. And these glass models were made by Leopold Blaschka and his son, Rudolf. Uh, like plants, these soft-bodied animals lose their lifelike appearance when they are preserved. But the Blaschka's glass models are realistic representations of living organisms that can be studied in classrooms and displayed in museums. Godel thought the Blaschkas could use the same glass working techniques to make equally realistic plant models for the Botanical Museum. The Blaschkas glass working lineage is believed to trace back to 15th century Venice and their craft was passed down through multiple generations. Leopold learned glass working from his father and he also studied painting, jewelry making and metalworking. Rudolf started working with his father in 1870 when he was 13 years old, and he officially joined the business in 1876. The family lived in Bohemia, which is in the present day Czech Republic, and they moved to Dresden, Germany in 1863. Leopold first had the idea to imitate marine invertebrates in glass uh, when he saw jellyfish while traveling to the United States in 1853. He made his first marine invertebrate models 10 years later in 1863 after moving to Dresden. Uh, museums and private collectors started ordering models from Leopold and over the next two decades, the Blaschkas established a successful business uh, producing invertebrate animal models for institutions all over the world. Hundreds of species were available to purchase. Godale visited the Blaschka's studio in 1886 to ask if they would make glass models of plants for the Botanical Museum. They were reluctant at first, but they eventually agreed to the commission. Uh, the first shipment was damaged during a customs inspection in New York, but the broken models were promising and they were shown to potential supporters, including Mary Lee Ware, who was one of Godale's former students. She and her mother, Elizabeth C. Ware, uh, provided funding to order more models and continue the project. So with support from the Wares, the Blaschkas divided their time between making invertebrate animal models for other institutions and plant models for Harvard. After three years, the Blaschkas wanted to, to focus on either zoological models or botanical models and they signed a 10-year contract with Harvard to work exclusively on the glass flowers in 1890. The Blaschka stopped making invertebrate animal models for other institutions at this time. Leopold died in 1895, and the 1890 contract was updated uh, to, uh, you know, for a one-person operation. Uh, many other exclusive contracts with Harvard followed, and work on the collection continued, um, always with the wearer's support. An agreement to make some models in 1886 turned into a 50 year long project. The final shipment of models was delivered in 1936, uh, but Rudolph continued working on the collection until his death in 1939. Over 50 years from 1886 to 1936, the Blaschkas produced 4,300 glass models that represent 780 plant species. They only made glass models of plants for Harvard, uh, but their invertebrate animal models are in collections around the world. The glass flowers were made by Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka alone. They didn't have assistants or apprentices. Their productivity was so great that about 70% of the collection was completed when Leopold died in 1895. The Wares were devoted benefactors and Mary supported the project until her death in 1937. The Wares also covered all related expenses, um, including the exhibit cases that are still in use today. The collection is a gift in memory of uh, Elizabeth's husband and Mary's father, Dr. Charles Elliott Ware, who graduated from Harvard in, 19, in 1834. The Blaschkas were exceptionally talented and innovative. 
they used lamp working to make the models. This is a glass working technique in which glass is melted in a flame and shaped. Lamp working is also called flame working or torch working uh, because gas fueled torches are used instead of oil or paraffin lamps today. The models are all glass, but wire was used for internal support. Tubes of glass were strung on a wire armature to form the stem, and leaves, petals, and other parts were attached with animal glue, or they were fused into place uh, with the flame. Early models were made from clear glass and painted after they cooled. Rudolph experimented with materials and methods after his father died. One of his greatest innovations was making his own glass enamels and using them to color the models instead of paint. Gelatin was used to create leaf veins and other details, and organic materials like animal glue and natural resin varnishes were applied to the surfaces of the models to reduce shine and mimic different textures. The glass flowers are realistic and scientifically accurate because the Blaschkas studied live plants. Other reference materials um, included their own drawings, botany textbooks and publications, and preserved plant specimens. The Blaschkas studied zoology and botany, and they applied this scientific knowledge to their work. The glass flowers proved to be an effective teaching collection and a very popular museum exhibit. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the collection has been displayed in the same gallery since the Botanical Museum opened in 1890. Changes and improvements were made to the exhibit after the collection was completed in 1936, but extensive renovations weren't possible because of the challenges involved with moving and storing the glass flowers. Part of the collection was displayed on the landing outside of the main gallery. These models were removed in October 2000 and put in storage. The lighting and heating, uh, ventilation and air conditioning systems were updated as there was a better understanding of how temperature, humidity, and light affect objects and artifacts. While improvements were made to the exhibit over time, the model arrangement didn't change. This is the same uh, area of the exhibit in the 1930s and in 2015, and the models are in the same places. The most extensive renovation of the glass flowers exhibit occurred in 2016. There was a year and a half of planning before work actually started in the gallery. And during this time, a new storage facility and a conservation lab were set up and the collection's first conservator was hired. The gallery was redesigned to maintain the exhibit's character and you know, historic charm uh, while necessary updates were made. The exhibit was completely emptied for the first time in the museum's history. All object handling was done by me and the conservator uh, with some assistance from local uh, art handlers. It took about six weeks to empty the exhibit. The floor plan was redesigned. Uh, the old layout divided the room into three sections and uh, the new floor plan is more open. Continuing to use the historic cases helped us maintain the exhibit's character. Most cases are over 100 years old and all of them were restored. The vertical cases along the walls remained in place, but the ones in the center of the exhibit were taken apart and used to build smaller cases. Eight new cases were designed for changing exhibitions within the Glass Flowers Gallery. The exhibit was extremely full before the renovation and having space to bring models out of storage for special exhibitions um, lets us show more of the collection and it gives visitors reasons to return. 
The models were rearranged according to the angiosperm phylogeny group. This is a contemporary classification system that reflects current knowledge about the evolutionary relationships among plants. Uh, the previous arrangement was based on the Engler plant classification system, which is what was widely used in the early 20th century. Taxonomy was updated and all labels were redesigned. And content about the evolution of land plants, composite flowers, and other botany topics uh, was added. Uh, the exhibit still feels like a Victorian museum display, but it presents current science. The HVAC system was replaced and upgraded. The models are sensitive to temperature and humidity fluctuations and unstable environmental conditions have damaged them over time. The new HVAC system keeps the temperature and humidity within a safe range to slow deterioration and preserve the collection. And a new LED lighting system was installed. Uh, the pigments that were used to paint early models are light sensitive and susceptible to color fading and shifting. Uh, the light levels in the exhibit are controlled to minimize light damage. Um, as you can see, other improvements were made, which include painting the room with bright neutral colors and uncovering and refinishing the original hardwood floors. Uh, the exhibit was closed for only six and a half months and about half of the collection is um, on display now. The exhibit renovation was the catalyst to start a formal conservation program. The glass flowers never had their own conservator. Uh, more recent research and conservation treatments were done on an as needed basis uh, by conservators from the Harvard Art Museums and the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard. Scott Fulton became the head conservator for the glass flowers in 2015 before the exhibit closed for renovation. Scott was a senior objects conservator at the Peabody Museum for many years, and he started working on glass flowers projects in 1997. He also provided guidance on the care and preservation of the collection uh, since then. Conservation was an important part of the exhibit renovation because many models needed to be stabilized, cleaned, repaired, and or remounted uh, before they went back on display. Since we were trying to minimize exhibit closure during the renovation, uh, there wasn't enough time to perform conservation treatments on every model. Uh, the conservation program is ongoing. Several exciting projects have happened since the exhibit was renovated including special exhibitions within the Glass Flowers Gallery and the publication of a new photography book on the collection. Uh, the last one was published in 1982, so this was um, another big project. And most importantly, significant progress has been made in the care and preservation of the glass flowers, so they are preserved for future generations. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer uh, some questions. Hey there. Um, this was amazing. And uh, my jaw has just been kind of like dropped this entire time looking at these flowers. I really cannot tell the difference between the glass models and like real plants. Yeah, they, um, they're, they're remarkable. And, you know, my, my photos are beautiful, but you really don't... Um, once you're in a, in a room, once you're in the exhibit and, and you see them in person, it, it's even more breathtaking. Gosh, I can only imagine. And that whole room from what you described really seems like a work of art, like from those restored cabinets and everything. And yeah, really, really amazing. Um, <laughs> super, super cool. And we have a bunch of questions uh, from our audience. So first one is just like, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the procedures and methods that you use to take care of and preserve and restore these glass flowers. Um, do you have any particular fun stories about your experiences with them? Um, so the, the glass flower staff is, is me and the conservator. Um, the conservator, uh, he's, he's the one who's, you know, more hands-on with the models and, you know, doing the conservation treatments. Um, you know, I am involved with, you know, moving the objects in and out um, of the exhibit. 
Um, the the exhibit renovation was was a huge project. Um, you know, I learned a lot on that project. Um, you know, I I personally put every object back on exhibit um, wow. before the before the exhibit reopened. Um, yeah, you just um, you know you you learn how to handle the glass flowers, I guess, the same way that that you would with any special collection or you know whether it's you know uh, cultural artifacts or artworks. Um, yeah, I usually say that the glass flowers are unique, but what I do with them isn't is pretty common to any collection manager. That's that's really cool, actually. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, and uh, Daniel asks, are the techniques that are used in making these glass flowers still in use today, or is it more like a lost art? Like, did the Blaschkas you mentioned they didn't have apprentices? Um, well, I was anticipating this question, and I have a couple other slides, if you don't mind, if I no, share my no, screen no. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Share away. <laughs> so people are still, um, you know, the, the glassworking technique that the Blaschkas used, um, it, it's an old glassworking technique. It's a pretty common glassworking technique. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm just going to zip through all my slides. No, really fine. Um, and people still, you know, people still make artworks um, using uh, lamp working, torch working, flame working. Um, a lot of people are inspired by the Blaschkas uh, and make works, um, you know, similar to them, inspired by them. Um, but nobody's, you know, people aren't making, you know, scientific models. Uh, what the Blaschkas did was, was really unique. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like the Blaschkas started making scientific models from glass and a whole bunch of other people started making them. Um, this is the work uh, by Lila Tabasso. She's a flame worker in, uh, in Venice. Um, I love her work. Um, you know, it, it has such strong emotions. Um, definitely check her out. Um, this is Deborah Moore. I love her work as well. She, um, she's, she doesn't do flame working, so it's a different process. Um, this is more traditional glass blowing. Um, but her work is also incredible. Uh, this is by Victor Tribuco. Uh, he, he's been making works using te only techniques that were available to the Blaschkas in, um, you know, the late 19th century. And, you know, of course, other artists are making works, um, you know, inspired by the glass flowers, but, you know, not glass plants. Mm -hmm. uh, this work is by Jenny Yershansky. And um, this is a, a uh, she made this, uh, you know, fake glass flowers case and um, cast uh, glass mounts with imprints of where uh, glass uh, flowers models were. And the four models in this case represent um, the four species, the four California uh, native plants in the collection that are currently endangered. And the paper cutout or barium specimens above represent um, the uh, invasive species that are competitors uh, to the, the native plants that are endangered. Um, yeah, so all kinds of people are making great works um, inspired by the Boschkas, similar to the Boschkas, um, but nobody's, um, I, I don't think anybody's really come close to what the Boschkas did. Yeah, I mean, wow. The, I'm, I'm glad you pulled the slides back up because it's really cool to see all these other like projects that have been inspired by, by it as well, um, or by them as well. Um, and then one final question for you. Uh, what what brought you into this field? Like, how, how does one get into caring for glass flowers, asking for a friend? The friend is me. <laughs> like... um, I, it's, you know, my you know, previous professional experience combined with a lot of luck. Um, my background is in art. Um, before I worked with the Glass Flowers and attended graduate school, um, I was a studio assistant for a glass artist named Toots Zinsky. Uh, everybody look up her work. It's um, incredible. Um, and while I was working with Toots, I assisted with the production of artworks and I managed her uh, digital and physical archives. So that inspired me to go to library school at Pratt in New York. And, um, you know, I really just wanted to work with 
you know, in a library in an archive with special collections. Um, and, you know, when I finished my, when I finished grad school, uh, the glass flowers job was open and I thought I had to apply for it. Um, I, I don't have, I do not have a biology botany background. Uh, that is not why I was hired, but I really have enjoyed um, learning about it along the way. My colleagues at the Harvard University Herbaria are, you know, so incredibly smart and so generous with their knowledge. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's always, it's always cool to hear people's stories of how they got into these really like interesting and unique fields. Um, so thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah. And happy International Museum Day to you. And we're going to go ahead and bring on our next guest, who is Chandra. <laughs> Can I go? Are we ready? We're ready and you can go. <laughs> oh, yay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Aloha. Um, my name is Chandra Earl. Um, I live in Honolulu, Hawaii, the absolutely beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to, to live here. And I'm very grateful for sort of the, the introduction and, um, and, and, and for uh, the presenters for allowing me to come to speak to you guys today. And so thank you for the invitation. And I apologize about this. <clears throat> um, anyway, I'm here today to share my appreciation and involvement in a just absolutely remarkable initiative that brings together the power of technology, um, the wonders of nature, and the passion of individuals. And so this is specifically the, the City Nature Challenge. Um, specifically, I, am, I want to highlight the way that this project is being utilized right here in the beautiful state of Hawaii, um, where I am just so, again, so incredibly lucky to live and work um, in sort of that vital research it plays in, in conservation um here um if you've ever been to hawaii like please throw it in the chat let me know where you've been like what's what you sort of loved about being here um because people tend to come here a lot for, for vacations and i love hearing about them i love hearing about your your uh sort of um views and opinions on on on, on this on this beautiful state um so now i'm mo I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of the city nature challenge or at least aware of i naturalist um but for those of you who don't know uh, the city nature challenge is a global effort uh, where people from all walks of life come together to document the biodiversity of their cities or in our case um we we do it at the island level so my island is oahu so our city nature challenge is the island of oahu uh, the City Nature Challenge is, is organized annually. It is an annual event that happens every year. Um, it actually just ended at the beginning of, of this month, um, but it's, and it's, it's organized by uh, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and, of course, Cal Academy, um, with joint efforts from local groups. Um, these are usually biodiversity or academic institutions in that reside in a city or a place. Um, and so in my case, the again, the island of Oahu is, is sort of our, our area that that, that we focus on. And it's jointly organized by my, my museum, which is the Bishop, the Bishop Museum, and you see the icon there on the bottom right, um, and the University of Hawaii, specifically the Ecology and Evolution Department. So I'm very, very grateful for, for them um, and sort of the collaborative nature that we have. It's, it's, it's so fun. Um, so we talk about how we can get uh, community science involved, how we can get people involved. Um, and this is sort of, you need to understand what iNaturalist is before we start, it, we start going into what the City Nature Challenge is specifically. And so iNaturalist is a, is a website and a mobile app. Um, you can go into uh, sort of whatever your app store is. It's on iPhone, it's on Android. Um, and basically it is an application that lets you create a profile where, and lets you upload photos. Um, and it will essentially tell you what that is. And so, you know, you go out, you find wildlife. Ideally, you know, it's in your backyard. It can be, um, it can be marine. So I, I've gone snorkeling and I've taken, you know, pictures of fish with my GoPro. Of course, I go hiking a lot. And so I, I like to take pictures of the plants that I see. I like to take pictures of the insects I see. Um, or you know, it's a, since I am an academic, I travel quite a bit. And whenever I go out of country, I go to all these really cool places. I, of course, don't know the biodiversity of these really cool places. And so I, I use I now 
evangelist quite a bit in, in my travels to, to figure out what it is that I'm seeing, to learn about sort of those plants and animals and, and insects and, and, and birds and, and whatever, whatever have you. Um, around me at that time. And so it's very, very easy. You'll use your phone. I've got, of course got my phone on me all the time. Um, I, you take a picture, you snap it, and you, of course, upload it to the app. Um, of course, and then the app um, does a, a couple of do cool things to try to tell you what that species is, that what you're looking at. Um, and it does this in two different ways. Of course, one, it, it does use artificial intelligence. You use, use, it uses computer modeling to try to look at that photo and tell you, hey, um, right, so for this, this example, this is um, Ohello, which is a native species of plant in um, a native species of plant in Hawaii. And of course, I uploaded this um, and it you know told me oh we're pretty sure it's in this genus it's in the genus blueberries cranberries and allies which is which is true it is this is the actual um, this is the actual species for this thing and so it does try to you know tell you what it is based on AI but the second and probably more um, important part of of this is that it also tries to uh, it also it also will use um, the community surrounding you to tell you what this thing is right so you'll post your observation. Um, of course, you know, you'll use AI to kind of like get an idea of what it is that you're looking at. Um, but the community can come in and essentially tell you what it is, right? Because there are people that I'm, I'm sure know more, way more about me in, in certain in specific areas than I will ever, ever, ever know about certain plants and animals, right? So this is an example of a what I thought was was a spider. Um, obviously, I had put spider on here because I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know anything about spiders. Um, but this was actually in Bulgaria where I was earlier this year. Um, and so I threw this up. I said, oh, this is this is a spider, I, I thought. Um, and of course, someone came in and said, oh, no, 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 this, this isn't a spider. This is a harvestman. And I, I don't know the difference. Um, I don't I don't know the difference uh, between the two. But uh, they this person then went and tagged two other people who are spider biologists in the uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, and they went ahead and told me what what species this was, right. And so because we've got essentially this really cool combination of computers um, and and the community and commu these community naturalists, right? Like I would I would never have ever been able to get a hold of these people or know who these people were without my naturalist. You can really sort of get this really cool data set that's that's, that's curated um, to you know what it is that you're specifically seeing. Um, and so I liked I when I first moved to Hawaii, same thing. Like we'll get into Hawaii biodiversity here in a second. But when I first moved here, I remember just being so overwhelmed because I knew nothing about um, again the plants and animals I was seeing. Of course, you know I bought a bunch of field guides, but those only get you so far. And I just remember like walking through, I walking through downtown Honolulu or walking through Waikiki and just like snapping all the pictures I could find because I didn't know what I was looking at. Um, but it really helps you teach. It really helps teach you kind of what it is that sh that you're seeing, um, and so that's that's really primarily the the reason I like to use iNaturalist is just so I can learn, which is a little bit selfish. But I also like to use it um, from a research data scientist point of view, and I'll get into that in a little bit um, later as well. So City Nature Challenge. So how does City Nature Challenge work? Um, the City Nature Challenge happens in two phases, and you'll have to forgive me. This is from two thousand. These these slides are from twenty twenty one, and so that's why um, some of the pictures on here say the twenty twenty one Nature Challenge. Obviously, we're in twenty twenty three, not twenty twenty one, so these dates are incorrect. Um, but the, the the area is about the same. It's usually um, end of April, early May. And so the this so it happens in two phases. Um, the first phase we refer to as the observation period, um, and so that's where participants, so people like you or I, will go out and we will observe and document species by either taking photos, um, you can take video recordings, you can take um, audio recordings in case of like bird calls. Um, these can be live images that you know images of live organisms they can be images of dead organisms they can be images of interactions any kind of proof that a species is you know where you you know where you're at any kind of proof um is is you know typically what you'll take pictures of and what you'll what you'll upload um and 
So, so that's what you're going to do during the observation period. You're going to observe plants and animals and, and fungi, any other organism, and you will share them on a naturalist. Um, and so usually it's a period of about three or four days ish, maybe five days. I don't know. Uh, about about that time, um, you know, where we kind of like send people off, like go go take your pictures, go do all things, go you know get as many observations as we can, because the idea of City Nature Challenge is that it is kind of a competition between these all these cities across the world, right? Um, you know, I, I think uh, Oahu tends to hit right about, about midpoint. Um, and I think somewhere in Brazil tends to be the winner every single year. Um, but anyway, it is it, it does end up being sort of a competition between um, cities, which is really, really fun. Um, and then the second essentially phase is going to be this identification period, right? So this this is this is the part where it's like, all right, now we got to learn what it is that we're looking at, right? Um, and this is where you have the opportunity, or you know, we'll have this. Essentially, it's a call out. We'll we'll call people out. We'll say, hey, like, come, you know, look at all these observations that all of these you know, all of these people took. Like any any people, right? It could be me. It could be you. It could be researchers. It could be students. Like people use this in the classroom quite a bit. Um, you know, bio blitzes, college campuses, anything, 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 anything. But we'll go out and say, hey, researchers, like somebody come in and identify all of these all of these images. Um, and this is where you sort of get those. Um, this is sort of where you get those observations coming in, where you get uh, to to accurately identify the images um, that you took. And you, um, like I said, you don't have to know what the species is before you upload it. That's sort of like the point of, of this, this second part. You just kind of have to help the, the community um, get on the path to an identification, right? So if I, if I upload something, same thing, I uploaded that harvest man, I thought it was a spider, so I put spider. If I upload, I've upload plants quite all, all the time and I'll just put plant because I don't, I have no idea. I don't know my plant taxonomy, so I just put plant. Um, same thing. I'll put like bugs, and I'm just like, oh, this looks like an ant. All right, I'll put like insect or something like that. Um, and you'll still notice. You'll notice in phase one that people will still be identifying things, but it's really that identification period. It's that real push to try to get as many things identified as possible, right? Because that then turns into data that helps researchers down the road do really, really cool things um, like the conservation efforts here in Hawaii I'll talk about. Um, and so the goal, and again, hope that hope by you know by the time this is all said and done, is that we'll compare the data collected across uh, these various different cities, and we can celebrate all of the species that together everyone has documented um, every single year. Um, so that's the nature challenge. You know, it's kind of a, an annual like push uh, to get people to use iNaturalist and get people comfortable with it and using it. But of course, iNaturalist is an app that you can use at any time. Um, so. Again, it, in our case, we are, of course, all the way over here. We're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, it started, like I said, it, it started um, in 2016, I believe, and sort of grown in the past. It's, it's grown exponentially um, uh, to where it is now, or I think like two years ago, uh, it finally hit a million observations. Uh, it hit a million observations for 2021. One, I think it was, which is an absolutely outstanding amount for City Nature Challenge. Um, and so these are the results from this past year. Like I said, this this did just end. Um, so you can see, oh, it says right here. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, so in 2018, this is 440,000 observations all the way up to, yep, yeah, in 2021, it hit 1 million observations, which is just absolutely outstanding. And then this year, we just fell short of 2 million observations. Which it, it, um, did absolutely amazing. Um, so, uh, like I said, we tend to make a competition out of this a lot. So this past year, um, so we've, uh, this, so the one on the left is going to be Oahu, but in the island of Hawaii, we do have two technical city nature challenges. We've got the island of Oahu, ours, and we also have the island of Maui that does theirs. Um, and we like to sort of have a friendly competition every year with, with them because if we are so uh, isolated from the rest of the world, you know, it kind of helps to have that, that fun little uh, local, uh, local competition, if you will. Um, so, you know, we we'll always tell people like, hey, go out, we need to beat Maui. Um, and then we always inevitably do beat Maui. So, oh, well. Uh, so this is yeah just just to kind of show you how um so this only goes to 2021 but this is the graph that kind of like shows the use of the observations uploaded per week to iNaturalist and you can very obviously see 
when um, the city of nature challenge hits because you get those peaks of observation every single year. And like, like I just said, we just hit 2 million. So this is again, absolutely amazing. But you see people are using iNaturalist more and more and more and more, which is really, really exciting. Um, of course, again, at the heart of City Nature Challenge lies that concept of community science, um, which empowers individuals and communities to contribute to scientific research and conservation efforts. Um, so by engaging everyday citizens, uh, this, this sort of transforms those passive observations. So we see a lot of, you know, people uploading pictures to like various Facebook pages. And I'm like, that's, that's great asking like, what is this? What is this? I'm like, that's great, but you should put this on iNaturalist because then we can, we have data and we can actually use it for something and you can still get what it is that you're, you know, asking for. Um, but, um, but this way, you know, it sort of bridges that gap between professionals and, and you know, some nature enthusiasts, if you will. Okay, uh, so this is what it kind of looks like. Um, different colors are, of course, different taxa. And this is Oahu. And so you can see um, there's, so they do uh, essentially shudder, if you will. They like hide um, rare species. And of course, we've got a lot of rare species in Hawaii. Um, and so you can see like this is, you can see where they've, um, sort of shuttered all of these guys to, to hide where they actually are found. Um, um, so in addition to having, of course, where these things are found, we also have the images for all of these things, which has uh, been super, super cool because we've got uh, just essentially a ton of data that we can then use to uh, look at um, things like conservation efforts um, across across Oahu. And so like, I'm going to focus on Oahu uh, with, you know, some sprinkling of other of other islands in there. But of course, you know, there are there are eight major islands and we're only one of them. Um, this just happens to be the one I live on. So like I said, Hawaii is, of course, absolutely gorgeous. So I took every single one of these pictures, um, again, various hikes, or I'm in them. So like this one I'm in. Um, and there is absolutely no shortage of beauty within Hawaii and super cool biodiversity. Um, you know, we've got black sand beaches. That's me sticking my head in this lake, actually, uh, because we were out on, in the field looking for, looking for, actually, um, we were whatever, looking for animals at the time. Um, get this again regular beach we've got the red sand beaches but unfortunately i like to show this a lot biodiversity in hawaii via photos versus biodiversity in hawaii via reality are two very different things um you know we, we tend to we look at these beautiful pictures of hawaii and we think oh my gosh look at this place it's absolutely gorgeous and it is like there's you know i am not i'm not saying that it's not but i am saying that hawaii is absolutely going undergoing a biodiversity crisis um in where most uh places on on in Hawaii are now um, sort of these alien and are overtaken by invasive species, right? So this is just Oahu that we're looking at, um, but you can see that only the very tip tops of the mountains. So there's two mountain ranges in Oahu. There's uh, this one over here, which are the Koalas, and this one over here, which are the Waianais. Um, and you can see that all of the native vegetation has been pushed to the very tops of those mountains um, and all of this sort of like low-lying stuff and halfway up of these mountains are becoming alien dominated forests which is a, a big big shame um and a real problem within within hawaii right um especially since this hasn't happened you know over hundreds and hundreds of years this has happened in the past you know this has only happened in the past 100 years or so this is this is very very recent and it's happening very very quickly and so there's a reason why of course hawaii is known as the extinction capital of the world it's because well lots of things that we have here are going extinct right um and so i want to take a quick break uh for a little bit and play a quick game called is it hawaiian and this is a really just to sort of get your heads around what is hawaiian and what isn't actually hawaiian because a lot of the things that i think are um that are portrayed as as hawaiian are actually not hawaiian um and so i want to get kind of your taste and so if you just throw in the chat if you think something is is hawaiian or is not hawaiian like go ahead and let me know so of course this first one is Hawaiian pizza, right? We talk about Hawaiian pizza all the time. It's, it's. I feel like it's a staple, kind of in every single pizza place. Hawaiian pizza, and so that's the idea of pineapple on pizza. But is this, is this actually Hawaiian? Great. No. Very good. Yes, I'm getting so many no's, which is fantastic. Oh, you guys know so much. Yes, Hawaiian pizza. Is absolutely not Hawaiian. Hawaiian pizza is Canadian, um, which and I, 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 of course, Hawaiian pizza is 
called Hawaiian pizza, right? Because it's got that pineapple on top, which of course then leads me into this sort of next thing. Pineapple is pineapple Hawaiian. Of course, we talk about pineapple a lot because, uh, you know, we do have a lot of um, pineapple. We do have a lot of, of pineapple fields here. If you come here and you, you come to the Dole Plantation, there's it's, it's very well known for like you think of think of Hawaii and you think immediately of pineapples. Um, but yeah, everyone, uh, everyone's super, super right. Hawaiian pineapples are not Hawaiian. Pineapples are South American. So uh, they were brought over to Hawaii, of course, because Hawaii is a very good uh, a, a, a very, very good um, uh, environment for growing sorts of things that are found in South America. Um, for, anyway, so it's really good for growing these things. Um, and of course, you know, they brought over pineapple um, to grow and they brought over sugar cane to grow, but neither of these things are anywhere near even close to Hawaiian. They're not Hawaiian. Um, all right, next, uh, this is plumeria, of course. Again, this is one of those flowers that we always inherently think, uh, we always think about when we think of Hawaii, you know, so those are the flowers that, you know, people will put um, behind their ear or they often make clips at them and they sell them at the drugstores here a lot of the times. It's very, very popular. Um, they also sell them in the airports. Uh, you know, you can take take a stick of it home um, and, and, and grow it. Um, but again, is this, is this Hawaiian? I see Tahitian. It's it's not Tahitian. So no, you're right. Plumeria is not Hawaiian. Plumeria is from South America. Again, a lot of things were brought here because it, because Hawaii has a nice climate, and a lot of things from South America can grow um, in this warm climate. Yeah, Plumeria, not Hawaiian. A lot of things that you think are not Hawaii or Hawaiian are not Hawaiian. Um, next one, I've got hibiscus. Right so classic classically hawaiian right uh we see these things all the time they grow here i you know i see them i sort of, sort of see them sort of littering the streets um almost uh and they're very gorgeous flowers they're huge and, and beautiful and I, and I absolutely adore them but are they are they actually hawaiian So hibiscus, hibiscus are Hawaiian. They are, so, but only a certain species. We actually only have two native species of hibiscus in Hawaii, but they are, they are, they are Hawaiian. Um, we've got, uh, like I said, we've got two of them and one of them, um, they are actually known for being the only floral uh, hibiscus that we have in the island. So normally when you smell hibiscus, they don't really have any smell, but the, the native ones that we have here are, are do have that smell. Um, so we've got, of course, this, this yellow one is a native one. We also have a white one that is native. So, you know, so are those red ones, not native, um, but still, we still, so they're, they're kind of, kind of Hawaiian. Hawaiian punch, I love this one, Hawaiian punch. Uh, so of course, Hawaiian punch, um, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, this is named after, of course, all of the, the fruits. I don't, I don't actually even know what the flavor of Hawaiian punch is, fruit, I guess. Um, but it's named because, you know, it's got all those flavors of different fruits. Again, you think of Hawaii, you think of all these different fruits. You think of mango, you think of papayas, you think of dragon fruit, you think of lychee, you think of um, rambutan, you think of all these really, really cool fruits that I guess are only found in Hawaii. Um, but is, yeah, is, is Hawaiian punch Hawaiian? The answer is no. Hawaiian punch is not Hawaiian. Hawaiian punch is from California. Same thing. It was named because of sort of that misconception that all of these fruits, all of those fruits that I just named are from Hawaii. And the reality is none of those are from Hawaii. Um, right, none of those are from Hawaii. Like uh, papaya, like, papaya, mangoes, they grow here. They are, they're grown here everywhere, but they are not native Hawaiian plants. They were brought here for agricultural reasons. Um, and, and yeah. Um, I will kind of, I'm going to skip through these because I am coming up at the end and I still have a lot more to go. So coconut, right? Coconut, 
we think of as being Hawaiian. Um, and so this is where it kind of gets sticky, right? So uh, coconuts are, again, not originally native Hawaiian, um, but they were not brought over by Western settlers. They were brought over by the Polynesians or the native Hawaiians. And so again, while it's things that they're not originally native Hawaiians, they, they were brought over by Polynesians. And there are a couple of other uh, plants. And so these are called canoe plants that people have brought over. Um, and this, this is one of them. Um, so again, coconuts, not inherently in Hawaiian, but also like not uh, not when not as we think of. Yes, breadfruit is one of those. Uh huh. So we've got you know, ulu. They they brought over I think five plants. They brought over um, coconut. They brought over breadfruit, which is ulu. Um, they brought over crab noni, um, which is sort of a famine uh, fruit. They brought over bananas, um, and I am forgetting the last one. Um, I'm forgetting the last one, but I'm sure I'll remember it eventually. But yes. All right. Um, guava, we just kind of talked about this. No. Strawberry guava uh, is one of the, this is not Hawaiian. And so people love strawberry. I love strawberry guava. I like going out on hikes and sort of picking all the strawberry guavas off of the, the plants. But strawberry guava is actually the most invasive tree in Hawaii. And so this sort of gets back into the iNaturalist part of this. Um, so this, I just threw, I grabbed the map of strawberry uh, guava from iNaturalist on Oahu. And you can see that, uh, remember, if you remember back to that map, we talked about alien species. We talked about all those alien species and sort of low land um, becoming overrun with alien species. That's, this is what we're talking about, right? So you're seeing all that strawberry guava sort of come up into these mountains and they're sort of around. I mean, you'll see this sort of pattern with all the invasive species we're about to see, um, but Right, we, we don't like strawberry guava. Strawberry guava tends to be um, a very, like I said, it's a very invasive plant um, because it, it, it creates those 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 fruits that are so delicious, but they also have really um, shallow root systems. And so, and they're also, they also create a chemical that keeps other plants from growing. So it's, I think it's a little bit poisonous or something like that. But the, the, what happens is it becomes this absolute monoculture of this one plant just taking over all of these native plants that we used to have and no longer have um, in Hawaii. And that I think like the, the it's something like 19,000 acres or something that is now covered by just, just strawberry guava. Um, and so there's, there's various, um, there's various invasive species management techniques that people are using to try to get rid of this, um, but strawberry guava is absolutely everywhere. Yes, I know. I love I, I love strawberry guava. It's delicious, but yes, it is it is incredibly invasive. Um, there are some other invasives, of course. Uh, so again, this is Hawaii is home to most invasive species on the U.S., etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Little fire ants, coconut rhinoceros beetles, albizia trees, rats, mongoose. There's your strawberry guava. Koki frogs, myconia, fireweed, and invasive algae. And so we'll only go over um, a few of these. Again, so the myconia is a really, really big one. And so like I said, people tend to use iNaturalist to track some of these invasive species. And that's kind of where I'm getting at. They use that to, to manage um, to manage these inv invasive species and sort of watch their spread, especially these very, very common, um, these very, very common plants. So myconia is a very, very big plant. Am I going over? Should I end? Hi, Chandra. Yeah, I just want to make sure that you have time for like one or two questions. So okay. Can, um, yeah. Okay. So All right. Well, on. hold on. I'll skip. I'll skip. I'll skip the bunch. Okay. okay. Uh, we have some great questions from our yes. audience. Yes. Um, okay. Well, okay. See. So, great. So, hold on just a second. So, Montana, also very, very invasive. Um, green parakeets. We don't have any native parakeets on, on Oahu, and they become a really, really big problem for farmers. Um, and especially on Kauai, is they're really trying to get rid of these rid of these green parakeets, even though I know and I love them, um, but they're invasive here, and they spread those invasive plants. So they spread the guava that we talked about. They spread lantana seeds um, that I didn't talk about. But um, same thing with cookie frogs. So cookie frogs are a really big problem on Big Island, um, and they're just now getting over to Oahu. We don't like cookie frogs because they have a really big appetite and they eat all of our native insects. Um, and so they sort of can out compete um, the the they out compete the endemic birds and the other native fauna that rely on them for food. Um, but in addition to invasive species, so this is just a project that has to do with the invasive um, invasive species on Oahu. But of course, we also track native species, which is really really cool. Again, I don't have time to go over some of them, but I wish I did. Um, this is called the apapane. This is called the apapane. It's one of our one of our native birds. We've got an uh, incredible uh, that sort of that classic. Um, so the Galapagos is obviously a really like classic example of this. We've got all the birds that have the uh, the beaks that have evolved to be what they eat. We also have those. Uh, this is the apapane. This is one of them. 
Um, and of course, Athapane is rapidly going extinct. So this, of course, is, is the iNaturalist um, uh, snapshots of them. We still have them. They sort of live. Again, they've been pushed to the very tip, tip tops of the forest. Um, but of course, they used to be used, their feathers used to be used um, in like these in these cloaks. Um, so these cloaks called ah ahuula. Um, and so bird catchers would essentially like have these like sticks with like sticky stuff on the top and they would hold them up until they and they waited until these birds came and land on these sticks. Um, and then after they would catch them, they would only pluck two feathers, two to three feathers from these birds. So they didn't kill the birds. They didn't skin the birds. They plucked two to three feathers and then they let them go. Um, right. And so because of the amount of effort it took to make some of these cloaks. Um, and, and so these cloaks were only uh, allowed to be um, worn by the leader, so the Ali. Um, and it, it, it was said that you, if you could manufacture one of these, if you had great mana, right, you could marshal all of those resources to manufacture these stunning stone garments. Um, so I won't say, I won't go too much into this. We've got, of course, native, native plants that people track with them. And, um, we've got various, various lay flowers. Um, fun fact, every single island has a individual color and it has an individual lay material that matches that color, right? So Oahu's is yellow um, and our flower is the Elima, which is what is shown here. Um, and so it takes about a thousand, a thousand Elima flowers to make one of these lays. Um, and they're again absolutely gorgeous. You can't do it anymore, but they're absolutely gorgeous and um, very, very pretty. Um, we've got native butterflies, which I won't, which I won't go through. We've got native snails, of course, as well, which are also all these are going extinct. Um, I'm so sorry to like. Jump I in. know. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> I'm done. I'm so sorry. Wait, I got so excited. Yes. Okay, I'm done. No, no, it's amazing. And um, just just wanted to ask like. A quick question or two um yes the first step uh, i mean hearing you talk about city nature challenge is so great and we have folks wondering how they can participate if they don't really have fancy equipment to take great photos of species that's the greatest part you don't need fancy equipment all you need is your phone <laughs> if you can if you can take a picture on your phone you can upload it um it's like i said it's just it's an app on your phone um where is my iNaturalist app is it's an app on your phone um, and you literally like, go in there and you make an account and it's, it can be linked to your Facebook, your Google, whatever, again, classic, classic sort of stuff. Um, and you hit new observations and then you can like link or you can upload any photos that you have and then go from there. So you don't need fancy equipment, although some people do. Some people, you know, are like the actual fancy photographers and they take these beautiful, beautiful photos and those are fine and dandy, but I'm not one of those. You just use your phone. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's great. Me neither. <laughs> um, and the second question from our audience uh, before we close is, uh, have any rare organisms or organisms that have been extinct been surfaced on iNaturalist through City Nature Challenge? Um, not that I know of. So most of the stuff, right. So I actually saw some other questions too, um, talking about, uh, you know, what really is the um, sort of what are the patterns that we see on iNaturalist for Hawaii. And so we do see that more visitors tend to post on iNaturalist than, um, than people that, that actively live here, which is totally fine. Um, that's to go for all islands except for Oahu. Oahu does have more um, uh, uh, people that live here that will post. Um, but we will also see, um, we also see a bias towards uh, sort of those amateur, not amateur scientists, whatever, the community scientists will tend to take more pictures of the invasive stuff, right? They'll tend to like stay in those, uh, those areas like, uh, like Waikiki to sort of like those, those, those lower areas. Um, whereas like, um, whereas the experts, if you will, tend to be the ones to go out and go, to go see the, uh, those more like rare, almost extinct stuff. Because like at this point, um, they're very, very difficult to find and very, very difficult to see unless you kind of have insider knowledge. Um, you're really, it's it's very rare to see them. Yeah, totally. All the more reason to <laughs> keep contributing all the data. That yeah, I'm sure it does happen. I'm sure it, it, it does happen. I just like, I don't know of any specifically due to City Nature Challenge yet. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, um, it's been wonderful hearing from you tonight. Uh, yes, I'm so sorry. How long did I go? <laughs> <laughs> uh we are it's 8 8 p.m here but okay um, i'm sorry <laughs> yeah the, uh, uh i know we're on a time difference too but thank you so much for joining us and yes, thank you go ahead and bring up our final guest of the night the wonderful ariel hammond to talk about museum collections <laughs> Thank you.
Oh man, Chandra, that was the coolest. I'm so excited about your talk because I'm going to be talking about iNaturalist a little bit. Um, I honestly forgot I was presenting for a minute there. I was so engrossed in your guys' talks. Um, but I just want to say, hi, my name is Ari Hammond. Um, I am the Director of Research, Library, and Archives at the San Diego Natural History Museum. Um, and I'm going to be talking about opening up our treasure chest. Um, but first, I want to take a minute to um, acknowledge the indigenous people who have been the traditional caretakers of our land since time immemorial. Um, and for us specifically, the Kumeyaay people um, on whose ancestral homeland our museum sits. Um, we honor their history of being caretakers and we hope that we are continuing in that vein and we are working with them. Um, and that actually leads me to the topic of my presentation, which is kind of this divide between modern and history. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about combining new technologies with our historic collections. Um, we are 149 years old, our museum. Um, we are the second oldest west of the Mississippi, um, only second to this little place called the California Academy of Sciences is a couple years older than us, um, but we're close. We're really, we're right in there. Um, and we're gonna be talking about engaging all of our communities in science, bringing people together around their interest in nature um, and I wanted to highlight some of these photos from our archives um, with modern representations of us doing the same things almost 150 years later. So we've got people doing a nature walk up here on the top left. Um, I call this the you can't sit with us pose. Um, and then over here, we have a, a big group of us. We went out on a mushroom foray recently, which I'll talk about more. Um, down here, we have people looking at, I think this is seaweed in kind of their Steve Zissou um, scuba outfits. Um, and then this is our botany curator showing my son a giant sea hare, which is a slug that's about the size of a football. It's terrifying, it's horrifying, I kind of love it. Um, but let's get into our talk. So actually the first project I wanna to talk to you is about our glass photographs. So, when photography was developed, at first people were taking pictures on metal, they were called daguerreotypes. For some reason, after using metal, they switched to glass and they had the emulsion printed like directly on the glass or they would apply it and they'd have a great big camera with the accordion style and they would expose the image for like 10 seconds and get a picture. We have over 2,000 of these images of the earliest pictures of flora and fauna in San Diego County, in Baja, California. Um, and they've been hidden for over 100 years in our archive. They were stored in cigar boxes and tackle boxes um, and inaccessible to everyone, including our own curators, because they're so fragile. Um, we actually wrote a paper about these uh, glass photographs that's titled please don't break. Um, it's under review right now. Hopefully it comes out very soon. Um, but we got a grant to digitize these photographs so that we can make them available for people around the world, um, expose their valuable data to everyone, and we are slowly uploading them to Flickr. Uh, this is one of my favorite images because it shows our museum president standing on the back of our birds and mammals curator, trying to get an image of a thresher nest up in this cactus, it looks like. So here's the glass photograph that's been digitized and then some of the information down on the bottom. Um, we've added all of these sites to Flickr. Um, we have a lot of visitors to our website, to our social media and a surprisingly robust Flickr engagement. Um, so one image after we added it got 800 views, uh, which really surprised us showing that there really is an appetite for these images. And we digitized them with partnerships with our local community colleges. So a big part of the grant to me was trying to get non-traditional students interested in STEM, um, encouraging community representation in STEM and in our museum, um, shifting the perspective of who belongs in science and natural history museums and who's allowed to tell stories and create meaning. 
Um, so these were my three apprentices, Noel Zacco, Alejandra Tomeo, and Diego Jimenez. Um, they've done a phenomenal job um, digitizing all of these photos for us. Um, and they have are since graduating from our museum um, and going on to do really exciting things. So Noel studies anthropology. She's just gotten into uh, graduate school in Oxford, which we're excited about. Alejandra is a local photographer who actually took glass photos of our curators and some of our staff to add to our collection. She's possibly one of the few people in San Diego County who can do this, who can take these images. We're so lucky to have her. Um, and then Diego also was interested in librarianship, and he's since gotten a position um, as a librarian at one of our local schools. So for us, it's building um, investment into our community and really supporting the people who are can make a big difference in our community. Um, and another thing I'd like to talk about is the library exhibit. So our library is divided into an exhibit for the public and then we have the back area, which is where the working library is. And we're trying to open up our treasure chest, open up our library as much as possible. And it started with this exhibit, which is completely dedicated to community science. So all of the items on display were created by community scientists, by people who weren't formally trained in science, but have still made a really big impact in science through their artwork, their personal collections, their field notes, um, and their photography. And we've had such a great response to this exhibit. Um, and we have so many materials. We actually have two shows that we rotate every two years to highlight new, different community science aspects. Um, we also have these interactives back here, um, which highlight some of our work with iNaturalist. Um, and if you recognize this very gorgeous exhibit or you're so impressed by it, um, one of the people who helped develop it, her name is Sam Moreno. She is now up at Calicad working on your guys' exhibits. Um, so with iNaturalist, um, we highlight our Herp Atlas, which is focused on herpetology in our region, Southern California and Baja California. That's our mission region. Um, we also highlight every year the City Nature Challenge. And for us, a really big one is the border bioplates. So we recognize that nature doesn't stop at political borders. Flora, fauna continue through those borders and yet are affected by the barriers that are created. Um, so for us, a big deal is to highlight all of our nature that's down by the border on both sides of it. Um, and it's nice that it falls within the same timeline as the city nature challenge. So we can kind of get a two for one with that one. Um, and the mushroom foray that I talked about, this is one of my favorites. Um, I love iNaturalist because anyone can download the data. Um, and I tell every kid that comes through our exhibit, every tour I do um, to take out their pho phone, take photos when they're hiking, but also go back to the website and see what's available in your area. So we had planned a mushroom foray and I was able to go on iNaturalist, get a border of the path that we were gonna take and recognize what fungi had been seen there. We went out, we saw 19 different species of fungi in that area, some which had not been documented before. Um, so this was the results of our the fungi we had seen on that uh, trip. It was a really cool, exciting thing. Um, and we're hoping to also do a hackathon, an ID party for iNaturalist, um, which Chandra mentioned earlier. Uh, Chandra, I hope I said that correctly. Um, of not just having experts come in and review, but also people who live in the area and recognize things, people who are um, amateurs in mycology, in ornithology, they can recognize a bit more than lay people can um, who aren't interested in that subject or don't know. Uh, so we're going to get together and try to do a little hackathon. Um, but another way that we're trying to get data out there, get people involved in scientific data, 
is to use this really cool platform called Zooniverse. So Zooniverse can help you identify things in images just like iNaturalist can. You can see something and say, I think it's this. Um, but you can ask more questions with Zooniverse that you can't always ask with iNaturalist. So it's still in beta, um, but we're working on having our glass photographs up in iNaturalist so people can add not just scientific names, um, but they can add common names maybe for their region because common names change so much. Um, because I can get it to, yes, this is a mammal. I don't know exactly what mammal this is. Um, and involving the community in this is a really fun, cool thing to do. Um, we also are trying to develop Zooniverse project for field notes. So we have in our 149 year history, um, many, many collections of field notes, people who have gone out and just taken notes on what they saw, but also what the weather was like that day. Um, maybe other species that were nearby, who was with them. Um, and it's, we've digitized a big number of them. I think we have 86 right now up on the Biodiversity Heritage Library that you can go read. Um, the majority of them are written in really hard to understand handwriting. So unless you know what you're looking for, it's really hard to find something in those. We can't send it through AI. The AI to identify handwriting is really um, in the process of being developed, could, could get a little bit stronger. And one cool thing we can do on Zooniverse is have the field notes up and say, what word do you think this is? This looks like a doctor writing a prescription scribbles to me. But another person might say that's the word um, thresher. And another person might say, I think that's the word ocotillo. Um, and it will go through and find um, kind of a consensus on words. So going through identifying information in field notes is a cool project to get people involved in. And then also that information can be really valuable for scientists and researchers across the world. Um, and finally, I, I talked about mushrooms a lot. One really cool project we're working on is called One Book, One Museum. Um, and this is a way to try to get a lot of our communities involved and in talking about the same thing. So we just started it this year. This is the first year. Um, I've been with the net for a year. Um, but I, in December, put out six options for people to vote on a book to read. And I tried to pick one for each department. We have an entomology book, a geology book, an ornithology. And I threw out a mushroom book, mostly just for myself, because I thought it was cool. And it was far and above the winner in the museum. The staff and volunteers were really excited about this book down here. It's called Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. Um, each month, we've done a really cool activity around fungi. Um, we've created these fact sheets about um, species that have been mentioned in the books. Uh, as I mentioned, we used iNaturalist, found locations, um, and then we've also last month um, started growing mushrooms out of books because uh, books are just dead trees that are waiting to be decayed by something like fungi. Um, so we got some damaged books that needed to be recycled, soaked them in water, put mushroom spores and a little bit of coffee in there for extra nutrients um, and are growing mushrooms out of this book. It's been a really cool project to see people from all different levels of the museum come together around this topic. People from the executive management to volunteers are gathering around at these book clubs. Um, next year, we hope to open it to members. I tried to apply for a grant to make us public, but we weren't public enough for the grant to make us public, but we're working on the funding. Um, but we're going to focus on climate change activism and history for next year, 150th. Um, and after that, to the general public um, to, again, involve them in science and breaking down the ideas of 
who's allowed to be interested in science and what officially science is. Um, you can have an interest. You don't have to be formally trained, and yet you can learn so much and find all of these different tools um, to talk about science. Thank you. I talked very fast. I apologize. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at library at sdnhm.org. Um, here's a picture of the San Diego Natural History Museum in Balboa Park. And this is me in our stacks in the library. Thank you, Ariel, for that presentation. Um, Aria and I are joining the One Book, uh, One Museum Book Club <laughs> as soon as it goes public. So just let us know, okay? <laughs> It, they're um, next week, actually, we're hosting a um, an academic talk about magic mushrooms. We're trying to keep it super scientific, uh, but I think it's going to be a really interesting talk. Oh, yeah, that sounds like it would you'd probably be more difficult to have like a boring talk about magic mushrooms. I, I, I want to encourage everyone to be very careful and safe out there. Uh, but there are really interesting applications for mushrooms um, kind of around the world. Wild. Um, we have some great questions from our audience, but I'd like to encourage everyone to continue asking anything that comes up. Um, what initially brought you to uh, being a librarian at a natural history museum? You know, it's really funny. I My whole childhood, I was just sitting outside reading and I could never pick between science and books. Um, and I ended up choosing books. And one day I was in a library taking one of those quizzes, what career should you have? And it said librarian. And I kind of looked up and was like, oh, wow, maybe I should do this. That's, I didn't even think that was a thing people could do. Um, and I started pursuing it and absolutely loved it. Yeah, it sounds like you've ended up in a place that's like, <laughs> really meaningful to you and the work you do is meaningful too. So that's great. Um, in your work kind of engaging communities through community science or all of these like really innovative ways of engaging the people the museum serves in the communities, um, have you seen any like kind of measurable impacts as regard, in regards to like perception or participation in the sciences? You know, I, I love to tell students that come through like, I was born and raised in San Diego. I toured the Nat when I was a kid. I never in a million years thought I could be one of the people that worked there. So encouraging those kids to say it like, you can see yourself in here. Um, we recently hosted a talk for the documentary Picture a Scientist, which is trying to kind of dismantle this idea of when you say picture a scientist, a lot of people think of maybe an older kind of stoic white man in a white lab coat. And that's not our museum at all. That's not almost any scientist I've ever really met. Um, so even just seeing the diversity in the community reflected in the museum, I think is helpful. Um, and again, encouraging kids, I tell them, you know, you can just draw. We have an Audubon uh, double elephant folio on display. And I say, this is, the second most valuable book in the world from a guy who just went out and drew stuff. And he didn't know what he was supposed to and what he wasn't supposed to draw. And so he ended up having a big impact on science kind of because he didn't know how he was supposed to do things. Yeah, that's an amazing anecdote. Do you have any like instances where you've kind of seen that aha moment? I'm sure you probably have plenty, but uh, you know, it's it's really exciting for me. And I see the aha moment, not just with little kids, but also even with, you know, older adults, grandparents leading their grandchildren through, um, board members coming through. And, you know, they kind of, okay, we're here at the net. And then all of a sudden they'll see a bug that interests them and they become little kids again. It's the cutest thing in the world. Yeah, I think... That's amazing. I think a community science, like you said, iNaturalist is like another great way to like, I know so many retirees who are like so avid, uh, such avid naturalists because they've been provided access through like apps like that. And, you know, that's a thing that we talk about of some people will say like, you know, oh, maybe the, the people who are, what's the word, like born into tech, get it faster. Um, but we just, 
we're trying to flatten even that idea. Everybody can learn new things at all times. You, uh, my great grandfather or my husband's grandfather was still emailing into the nineties. He, he was learning what these technologies were. So I, I, I like to encourage everyone, try this new thing. You can try and fail and that's actually the scientific method. So you're already a scientist. That is science, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, a couple of people uh, had a couple of questions about uh, Zooniverse and kind of what questions uh, you can ask outside of just transcriptions or like what kinds of possibilities are there on that platform? Well, so um, even the, the glass photographs that I showed, you know, some people might focus on maybe there's a mammal species right in the center, but uh, a botanist will see all of the plants around them. And maybe an entomologist will see the bug flying on the side. Um, so we can really get the ecology. And to me, what's also really interesting is to see the landscapes that have changed. I don't know every hill in San Diego, but there are people that will say, hey, that's Lakeside, that's Bonita. It, so kind of finding those connections. And those are things that we might not think to ask, but getting as much data as possible, letting people provide this data, kind of community input in it, instead of us directing where it will go, I think is really helpful and beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one last question for you is that the, the, do either you or the next class of students that you uh, you mentor, do you have any projects planned for the future? Like what are the next things well, we, that out? Yeah, we actually, um, the slide that I opened on that had a cassette, um, we've applied for a grant to digitize our recordings at risk. Um, we have 900 recordings at risk that range a gamut of different technologies. So we have a very old film reel of the construction of our building from 1933. And then we've got cassettes from the eighties of someone's talk. We've got, um, you know, camcorders and floppy disks. So like all of these really cool technologies. And again, because people haven't been listening to cassettes, no one currently at the museum knows what's on them. So it's really exciting. Yeah. it's. Uh... That's so interesting, like find it like the age of discovery, like you have to like go back to it. Like it's it's not the it's not always like a forward arrow. Yeah. Like, discovering our own discovering items. Things. Yeah, it's it's That's crazy. Amazing. That's wild. Well, thank you so much for sharing about this really exciting, uh, inspiring work. Happy International Museum Day to you. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. This has been awesome. Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna bring Aria back up. Thank you. Hello. And we're back. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Jennifer, Chandra, and Ari. We are so thrilled to be hearing from all of you tonight. Um, and to those of you tuning in, we hope this check inspires you to check out your closest natural history museum. Say hi to them for us. If you just can't wait to visit, though, and you want more museum content right now, we have lots and lots of museum focused, collections tour focused programs that are recorded on our YouTube channel that you can go check out right now. And yeah, go, go, go see a museum. Happy Museum Day. <laughs> Yeah, every day is kind of museum day for us. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. Live here. <laughs> we here at school, we're live here the third Thursday of every month, which means that we'll be back on June 15th to introduce you to scientists who work with organisms that are pretty particular about where they live. Uh, species whose entire ranges are confined to an almost an unbelievably small area, meaning they can only be found on one place, in one place on Earth, whether that's a specific thermal valley or one pool of water in the middle of the desert or like a single hill right down the road in the Bay Area. We'll be getting to know these species with the Lilliputian distributions in a program we're calling Night School Home on the Tiny Range. 
I'm so glad I got to say Lilliputian distribution. We, I, I, like, got to tell you, we really went back and forth on those names. <laughs> nice school Lilliputian distribution's got a ring to it. <laughs> but until then, you can subscribe to the California Academy of Sciences YouTube channel so you'll be notified and ready to meet those tiny range species because you definitely won't want to miss them, trust us. And you can also rewatch past episodes, including this one, on our YouTube channel from anywhere on Earth at any time. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, happy International Museum Day. <laughs> See you next one.